Good evening, and welcome to the New York Society Library. I'm Sarah Holliday, head of events. As we begin a couple of points of business, uh, if you could please silence cell phones or anything that might go bleep or fleetal during the presentation, we'd appreciate it. And we're glad to have books for sale by our friend from the corner bookstore um, right over here, and uh, you're welcome to purchase them and get them signed after the presentation. And a brief mention that everything we do here, from lectures like this one to performances, children's activities, book buying, and maintaining our beautiful building, depends on the support of our donors. Fall is annual fun time, and if you might like to support any or all of the library's mission, we'd love you to join in. Please speak to any staff member. So I'm one of those people with an aunt who's all into Ancestry.com, and one of the things she recently uncovered was that apparently my long-distant ancestors moved to North America from Europe to escape persecution because they were Quakers, and I thought that was a pretty cool thing to find out. Of course, that's the sort of reason many people relocate to this continent now, but because the holidays did it back in the 17th century, according to the default American narrative that I've inherited, somewhere in there, of course, we stopped being immigrants and we lost track of what it was like. And that's part of the reason I value so much the informed yet personal perspective of this land is our land. As Lauren Markham put it in the book's New York Times Review, in an age of brutal anti-immigrant rhetoric and policy, this land is our land offers a meticulously researched and deeply felt corrective to the public narrative of who today's migrants are, why they are coming, and what economic and historical forces have propelled them from their homes into faraway lands. We're delighted to have Suketu Mehta back in the members' room after an outstanding event on Maximum City back in 2005. That book was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and his other writings have taken home the Whiting Writers' Award, the O'Henry Prize, and a New York, New York, you'd think I could say that, a New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship. He's also recently been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. Mr. Mehta is an associate professor of journalism at New York University. Please join me in welcoming Suketu Mehta. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that very generous introduction. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be here in this most beautiful of libraries. Um, as my friend and NYU colleague Eric Kleinenberg uh, refers to buildings like these in a recent book about libraries, these are truly palaces for the people. Um, so I'd like to talk a bit uh, about my new book, uh, This Land is Our Land, An Immigrant's Manifesto, the subtitle. Um, I'll tell you a bit about how the book came about. So for the last, so I've written a book about Bombay called Maximum City, which was the last book I read from here in this library. Um, and then after that, I've been working on a book about New York City for, oh, about the last 10 years. Uh, I set out to, seems like, catalog the, the lives of every single person living in the city of New York. Um, and I've met about half of them so far. Um, it, it began as a book about immigrants uh, in New York and then expanded to you know, just about anyone who finds themselves in New York. Uh, two out of three immigrants, two, two out of three New Yorkers are immigrants or their children. And that's roughly the ratio of the stories in the New York book, two out of three of the stories tend to be about immigrants. Um, and you know, I was writing my book uh, happily. Um, my editor was less happy. Um, and then uh, the 2016 election happened. And for the first time in my life in uh, this country, I came uh, from Bombay to Jackson Heights in 1977. And with each year, I felt more and more American. Uh, I've lived in England, I could never really feel English. I've lived in France, I could never really feel French. I've lived in Brazil, I certainly couldn't feel Brazilian. I don't dance well enough. <laughs> but each time I would come back from these countries and my plane would you know, descend into JFK and I'd see the Long Island shoreline, I'd feel, all right, I'm coming home, this is home. 2016 put all of that in doubt again because there was this message spreading out that I wasn't quite at home. This wasn't quite home for me or people like me. And then a magazine called Foreign Policy asked me to write a book, uh, uh, asked me to write uh, an article for a special issue they were doing on uh, 
global migration. And said maybe you have some family story and you can write about um, your family's immigrant journey, immigration journey. And I said, yeah, sure, I can do something like that. Um, and I thought I'd take a little break from um, the New York book and do this article in a couple of weeks. But as I f started writing it in the summer of 2017, I found myself getting more and more angry. Angry at the way migrants are depicted around the planet as robbers, rapists, termites, uh, you know, people who are coming here to take, steal, rob. And I started asking, why is it that people are moving? And people are moving like never before. There's a quarter of a billion people today, uh, people like myself, and I imagine some of you in this room, who are living in a country other than the one they were born in. Why are people leaving? It's not because they hate their homes or their language or their culture, their people. It's because, in many cases, the rich countries have stolen the future of the poor countries through colonialism, war, corporate colonialism, and climate change. And I started collecting these thoughts um, and I wrote this, this article. Um, and the article and the book um, have this story in it, and my book actually begins with this story, which is, so my grandfather was born in rural India, uh, and he moved, uh, this is when India was ruled by the British, and then he moved to another part of the empire, he moved to Kenya uh, in the 1920s, and he worked all his life in Kenya, and then he retired in London, uh, where his son uh, was then living. So my grandfather is sitting in a park in uh, northern London in the 1990s, minding his own business, and this elderly British gent comes up to him and says, why are you here? Why don't you go back to your country? And my grandfather, who was a Gujarati businessman, said, because we are the creditors. You came to my country, you took my gold and my diamonds, you prevented me from building my industry, so we've come here to collect. <laughs> we are here because you were there, he said. And it seems to me an apt framing for uh, many of the reasons that migrants move. So the article came out, and I started getting death threats from white supremacists, this racist organization, We Dare, mounted a campaign against me because I was daring to uh, question this narrative about, you know, the, the whole debate around uh, migration here in, in the West generally is, should we let in immigrants? How many should we let in? What kind should they be? Should they be skilled? Should they be unskilled? Should they be white? Should they not be white? Should, um, and what I dared to ask is, well, what about the view of the migrants themselves? And so, um, you know, the article caused a bit of a furor, and Coulter started tweeting against me. Um, um, and uh, I uh, decided that uh, enough people disliked my writing so that I should expand it into a book. <laughs> um, and so I put aside my New York book. I did, took a sort of busman's holiday from... Uh, my New York book, and I wrote a book about migration, and it builds on research that I've been doing for many years. So I've uh, been going to look at walls and borders all over the world, in Hungary, in um, uh, Mexico, in Morocco, the, the borders between India and Pakistan. Borders fascinate me. Um, and and then I, I came out with this book, and the story begins with this story my grandfather tells me. Um, so I'll read out a couple of very short excerpts from the book, um, which will give you an idea of the, the sense of uh, concerns I have. The West is being destroyed, not by migrants, but by the fear of migrants. In country after country, the ghosts of the fascists have rematerialized and are sitting in parliaments in Germany, in Austria, in Italy. They have successfully convinced their populations that the greatest threat to their nations isn't government tyranny or inequality or climate change, 
but immigration. And that to stop this wave of migrants, everyone's civil liberties must be curtailed. Surveillance cameras must be installed everywhere. Passports must be produced for the most routine of tasks, like buying a cell phone. Take a look at Hungary, where Viktor Orban has forced out the Central European University and almost destroyed the country's free press and most other liberal institutions, using immigrants and George Soros as bogeymen. Or Poland, whose ruling party purged the judiciary, banished political opponents from government media, greatly restricted public gatherings, and passed a law modified only after an international outcry, making it a crime to accuse Poland of complicity in the Holocaust. Or Austria, where the neo-Nazis in the governing coalition want to flunk kindergartners for not knowing German. Or Italy, where a fanatically anti-immigrant coalition that won power until recently is now going after the Roma. All these road to power or intensified their grip on it, like Orban, by stoking voters' fear of migrants, promising to ban new immigrants and to take away the rights of immigrants already in the country. Once in power, they energetically set about depriving everyone else of their rights, migrants or native-born. It's a successful strategy for fear mongers. Driven by this fear, voters are electing in country after country leaders who are doing incalculable long-term damage. And some liberal politicians blame not the fear mongers or the people who vote for them, but the migrants. Europe needs to get a handle on migration, declared Hillary Clinton on November 2018. It must send a very clear message. We are not going to be able to continue to provide refuge and support. Because if we don't deal with the migration issue, it will continue to roil the body politic. The economist Jennifer Hunt tells a story about visiting Germany recently and listening to people making the liberal argument against letting in refugees. If we let these people in, we'll have the far right in government. Hunt's response, if you don't let these people in, you've already become a far right government. It was fear of migrants that led the British to vote for Brexit, the biggest own goal in the country's history. (laughs) In the lead-up to Brexit, the far-right member of the European Parliament, Nigel Farage, unveiled a poster showing a horde of non-white males attempting to cross into Slovenia with the slogan, Breaking Point, the EU has failed us all. It turned out that the photograph was of a column of refugees, not economic migrants, and was similar to an image used in a nap. Nazi propaganda film. But it worked and Brexit passed. In the year after the Brexit vote, hate crimes in England and Wales jumped 29%. The young Brits who were gobsmacked by Brexit, even though a majority of them didn't vote for it, will soon experience firsthand the rigors of border control that their forefathers made people like my mother endure. Here in the United States, voters motivated by an utterly irrational fear and hatred of immigrants elected in 2016 a leader who might end up being the most destructive in the country's history. In surveys, Trump's promise to build a wall was the single most important factor cited by crossover voters, including women. When Congress refused to fund his wall, he shut down the government itself for the longest period the nation had ever known, causing enormous economic and political damage. For much of the 20th century, America's greatest threat was from outside. Japan, the Soviet Union, then from Al-Qaeda. Now we realize that the greatest peril comes from within, from the heartland, Queens, New York, where Trump was born. Only a year into his presidency, Donald Trump had succeeded in making the country I call home the most polarized I've ever seen it. Democrat versus Republican, Anglo versus Latino, urban versus rural, rich versus poor, men versus women, people are at each other's throats as never before. A battle is being fought today in the public square, in the political conventions, on the television, in the op-ed pages, a battle of storytelling about migrants. Stories have power, much more power than cold numbers. That's why Trump won the election. That's why Modi in India and Orban and the Philippines Duterte won power. A populist is, above all, a gifted storyteller. And the recent elections across the world illustrated the power of populism, a false narrative, a horror story about the other entertainingly told. 
The fear of migrants is magnified by lies about their numbers. Politicians and racists train minds to think of them as a horde. In all the rich countries, people, especially those who are poorly educated or right-wingers, think that immigrants are a much bigger share of the population than they really are and think that they get much more government aid than they really do. A recent study found that Americans think that the foreign-born make up around 37% of the population. In, real, in reality, we're only 13.7%. In other words, in the American imagination, we loom three times as large as we really are. The French think that one out of three people in their country is Muslim. The actual number is one out of 13. British respondents to the poll predicted that 22% uh, of Britons will be Muslim by 2020. The actual projection is 6%. A quarter of the French, one in five Swedes, and one in seven Americans think immigrants get twice as much in government handouts as the native-born. This is not remotely true in any of these countries. Americans estimate that a quarter of all immigrants are unemployed. In reality, only under 5% are. But there are also counter-trends and counter-examples. Multiple studies have found that people who have direct contact with immigrants have much more positive views about their work ethic and reliance on welfare and are much more open to increased immigration. And there are leaders who welcome migrants, however embattled they may be. Um, when countries safeguard the rights of their minorities, they also safeguard, as a happy side effect, the rights and economic well-being of their majorities or other minorities within the majority. If a judiciary forbids discrimination against, say, Muslims, it's also much more likely to forb forbid discrimination against, say, gays. The obverse is also true. When they don't safeguard the rights of their minorities, every other citizen's rights are in peril. Every majority is composed of a set of discrete minorities. When you go after Palestinians and Africans in Israel, the reformed Jews are next. When you go after Muslims in India, the Christians are next. When you go after Muslims and Mexicans in America, the Jews and gays are next. The early targets are easy to hit under the cover of nationalism, but hate, once fed, grows ever more ravenous. It is never satisfied. So in my book, you know, I've looked at each of these four factors, um, colonialism, war, inequality, and climate change, and I, I spend a lot of time sort of gathering the, the figures. Um, I'm just going to get some water. So the story that my grandfather told me about, or, or the British gent about, we are here because you were there, it's kind of empirically true. When the British arrived in India, at the beginning of the 18th century, India's share of world GDP was 23%. By 1947, when they left, India's share of world GDP was under 4%. During the colonial period, the European share of world GDP went from 20% to 60%. They ruled these countries, the British ruled India, by deliberately applying a principle called divide and rule. Um, Lord Elphinstone, who was one of the viceroys, uh, once said, divide et impera was an old Roman maxim and it shall be ours. So they deliberately separated in, uh, Hindus and Muslims and other religions. And among the worst things that the colonizers did uh, to the colonies was their lousy colonial map making. After ruling India for hundreds of years, the British were in a hurry to leave um, after the Second World War. So they brought down a barrister named Sir, R Sir Cyril Radcliffe, who'd never been to India, who had nothing to do with India. Lord Mountbatten brought down this barrister and gave him five weeks to draw two lines down a map, separating home, uh, land that is now home to 1.8 billion people, the countries of Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India. You know, Pakistan and Bangladesh were one country then. And in the drawing of these two lines, there were all these people, you know, hundreds of millions of people who didn't know which side they were going to end up on. So as a result, these massacres of partition happened. And um, some two million people died in the ensuing riots. 
17 million people had to move, uh, one of the last, largest mass migrations in history. I've interviewed some of these survivors of partition on the Punjab border. Lahore, uh, one of the biggest cities in Pakistan, didn't know which side of the border it would be until a few days after independence because the line hadn't been finalized. So there was mass ethnic cleansing. People fell on each other. Um, it ha the same thing happened in Africa. If you look at a map of Africa, it abounds in straight lines. These were created by the colonizers and they bisected tribal homelands, leading to permanent conflict between these tribes who were just trying to regather themselves across these boundaries. 40% of all the national borders in the world today were made by just two countries, Britain and France. Um, it extends to the Americas. The amount of silver shipped between 1503 and the early 1800s amounts to a debt of $165 trillion that Europe owes Latin America today. Um, when the colonizers left, they were replaced by their corporations. Um, and here I have taken a look at um, one of the biggest ways in which developing countries stay poor, which is tax havens. 40% of the profits of all the multinationals in the world are immediately moved to tax havens. Developing countries lose three times as much to tax haven as the foreign aid they receive. Um, every year, $150 billion leaves Africa alone for tax havens. And what does this mean to ordinary people? So I was in uh, Tangier in Morocco last year. And I came across this family from the country of Guinea, um, a mother and father in their 20s, and a newborn baby. The baby was like five days old. He'd been born in Tangier. And I spoke to them uh, in their little room um, and I held the baby in my arms. And they were going to cross the Mediterranean in a little, it wasn't even a lifeboat, it was like a beach dinghy, like a plastic thing which would cross over this incredibly dangerous crossing. And they had this plan. They were going to drug the baby. They were going to buy these drugs that would keep the baby quiet for 24 hours so that the baby wouldn't cry during the crossing. And I pleaded with them not to do this. They would kill the baby. They loved this child. And they had come all the way from Guinea, from Conakry, to uh, go to Europe. Why would they want to do this? Why would they want to risk their firstborn, risk their own lives? Guinea is not a poor country. Or it shouldn't be a poor country. It holds up to half the world's bauxite. It has diamonds. It's got other minerals. But most of its minerals are owned by foreign companies, including an American hedge fund called Oxif, which, according to an SEC report, bribed Guinean of officials tens of millions of dollars and then paid hundreds of millions of dollars in fines to the SEC and Justice Department, the US Justice Department, for, for corrupt practices in Africa. That money didn't go to Guinea. It went to the US Treasury. The head of Oxif, Dan Oak, uh, last year he bought an apartment at 220 Central Park South in a building where the apartments go for a quarter of a billion dollars. But he had enough money that he didn't have to leave his other apartment in New York, a penthouse at 15 Central Park West, which only goes for a hundred million dollars. Another executive uh, at Oxif, Michael Cohen, bought a 900 acre English estate in Surrey. And criminal charges were later launched against him. So in country after country, you see these corporations. If you go to you know, any of these small African countries, you go to the, you know, the Sheraton or the Hilton, the, often there'll be like these people huddling, the local kleptocrats, dictators, uh, oligarchs, um, with a few Western executives plotting how to divvy up the spoils of the country. Um, so this kind of corporate colonialism, you know, we certainly 
have a history of that as Americans. At one point, the United Fruit Company, an American company, owned 42% of all the land in Guatemala. You know, we say we're not colonizers. We, um, um, we were a colony ourselves. But our record in Central America is a pretty sorry one. Uh, every time there was any kind of um, democratic opposition uh, to the local junta of the landowners, the U.S. went in there and, you know, uh, sent in the Marines or exerted pressure uh, to topple democratically elected leaders for the benefit of American corporations. So colonialism was replaced by this kind of corporate colonialism. Um, and then the third factor is war. We went into Iraq and launched an illegal and unnecessary war in which 600,000 Iraqis lost their lives. The U.S. funded a civil war in El Salvador cost 75,000 lives. It's not just big wars, it's the little wars fought with guns. We complain about, gun, about gangs in the Northern Triangle countries. Where do you think the guns come from? During the Nicaraguan conflict, the U.S. pumped 1.8 million guns into El Salvador alone to arm the Contras, and those guns are still there. 75% of the guns in Mexico, 98% of the guns in the Bahamas come from the United States. And any time there are any serious efforts to stem this flow of guns, the NRA stops the UN from taking any action. Like there was a small arms uh, treaty which the UN wanted to pass and the NRA leaned on the US to, to veto it. The f uh, fourth and most important reason people uh, are migrating is climate change. If you think 4 million Syrians um, flooding into Germany are a problem, what happens when Bangladesh gets flooded and 40 million or 400 million Bangladeshis have to f find dry land? Where do you think they're going to go? By the middle of the century, um, up to a billion people are going to be displaced by climate change. Um, there was a study that came out from Stanford University that since 1960, Global warming has reduced the size of India's economy by 31%, but increased the GDP of cold countries like Norway and Sweden by 10% because they're able to exploit minerals uh, in the Arctic. Uh, they're able to farm in land formerly covered by snow. But it's, uh, climate change affects different countries differently, and it affects the countries closest to the equator uh, uh, most dramatically. I, this... Uh, this summer, uh, temperatures in northern India were 123 degrees Fahrenheit. People were roasting to death. Some 10,000 people died of heat waves. Um, we Americans are 4% of the world's population, but we put one-third of the excess carbon in the atmosphere. European countries, another uh, one-quarter. We're the only country to have walked away from the Paris Accords. The U.S. military alone emits more greenhouse gases than 140 countries. The average American uses as much energy as 35 Indians or 185 Ethiopians. So, you know, a lot of what I'm doing in the book is just following this sort of chain of cause and effect. And what I'm calling for in the end is immigration as reparations. You break it, you own it. Um, I think there should be national quotas, if there are to be quotas for migrants, depending on which country has despoiled which other country the most. So England should have quotas for Indian and Nigerian migrants. Um, the United States should have quotas for Salvadoran and Guatemalan migrants. France should have quotas for Haitians, uh, and so on. Um, so it's an angry book because the whole you know, debate, as I said, is about what's in it for the rich countries. And it's particularly angry when it comes to this depiction of immigrants as takers, as, as, as a horde, as vermin in some cases. I mean, the language that Trump uses about Mexicans is despicable. And most of all, there's this idea that migrants are basically, you know, the, the idea of the migrant in the Western imagination is a young man in a hoodie who's come here to sell drugs or to rape women. 
if you really want to know what they like, so in my book, I, I call them ordinary heroes because almost all of the migrants that I met who are trying to cross over borders are people with incredible family values. They're crossing because they want to make a better life for their families, the families that are coming with them and the families that they've left behind. So I have a section in my book about a place called Friendship Park on the U.S.-Mexican border. Friendship Park was established under the Nixon administration. Um, it's the only place in the entire southern border where if your family is on the other side of the border and you're here and you don't have the right papers or you're, you only have a work authorization, you can't leave the country, it's the one place where you can go and see your family face to face. So under the Nixon administration, there's this place where um, there's a big wall in uh, that runs through much of the south in, in California, and it kind of ends uh, right by the Pacific Ocean. But right before it ends, there's this little patch of uh, ground where under the Nixon administration, you could go there, you could meet your family, and you know, for a couple of hours, you could have a picnic with them, you could give them a hug, then they'd go back to that side of the border, you'd come back this side. And with uh, successive administrations, the Clinton administration, um, put up a set of bollards. This was strengthened by the Obama administration. And then under the Trump administration, there was this thick, ugly, industrial mesh fence. So you can still go there. The Border Patrol controls Friendship Park, but you can only go there now uh, on weekends for 10 minutes at a time. So I spent two weeks there. And I saw some of the most heartbreaking reporting of my career. I saw a Mexican man who hadn't seen his mother for 17 years. He'd come here so that he could send money back for her medical treatment. Every week, he sends a gyro to his mom. And he's here, he was living in Colorado. He'd come, taken a bus all the way from Colorado. He was seeing his mother finally after 17 years. She'd come up from a distant Mexican province. And they're up, he walks towards this fence and his mom comes up and they put their faces up to the fence. And he told me later, he says, he could feel her breathing. He says, Mama, I miss you. She says, I love you. And he says, are you eating right? You look too thin. And he, he wants to give her a hug, but there's this thick metal between them. So they put up their hands, and the holes in the fence are only large enough to put your pinky finger through. So he puts his pinky finger through, mom puts up her pinky, and they do this touching of the pinkies. All along the fence, there's mothers and children, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, best friends, doing this kissing of the pinkies. And it just made me think, you know, what, what justifies this? What how would it hurt any government to let them give each other a hug? So I put this question to the head of the Border Patrol who was guarding this. Uh, it was a man named Rodney Scott, a man from Indiana, who told me that he took this job because he was a Christian. It, he felt it was his calling. And I said, so I, I'm not a Christian, but my understanding of the Bible is hospitality to the stranger, room at the inn. Uh, you know. I says, well, it says right there in Genesis, God deported Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden and built a wall around it so they couldn't get back in. It was an Obama who was the deporter in chief, it was God, and Adam and Eve were the first illegal aliens, according to the Border Patrol agent. Um, so I spent two weeks at Friendship Park just watching these people, you know, and almost all of them had crossed over so that they could send money to their families. They were ordinary heroes, they weren't robbers, rapists. No one had come over the border to think, America is a country where I can, you know, sell drugs and get away with it. They, I mean, they do sell drugs, and we are their consumers. We also armed their gangs, and we, we also created the gangs in the prisons of California. MS-13 was born not in El Salvador, but in the prisons of California. If you've ever, you know, Thanksgiving is coming up, and if you've ever been sundered from someone in your family, if you've had a break with someone, you know, go to Friendship Park and see what happens when a state 
put itself between you and a family member. And you see the longing of these people to reunite. Um, so, as I said, you know, it's, it's an angry book, and it's not just about migration in America. I've been going through these borders all around. And it's also uh, not just a Western problem. I just came back from India, where under the Modi government, India is the most hostile to migrants that I've ever seen it. Um, there's an, uh, the Indian state of Assam recently did uh, a registry of Indian citizens under which four million uh, people living in Assam were declared illegal uh, because they uh, didn't have the right papers. So you need to provide papers to provide citizenship, to, to prove citizenship. And anyone who's been in India knows how impossible it is to get any kind of paper out of the government. Um, it turned out that uh, of these four million people who were about to be stripped of their citizenship, the majority were Hindus from Bangladesh. So the go Indian government is a, you know, sort of, uh, wants India to become a Hindu country. When they saw this, they quickly backtracked. And they're now changing the citizenship bill to say that people can come in from neighboring countries as long as they're not Muslim. So it, the bill specifically says if you are a Hindu or a Sikh or a Christian from neighboring countries, you can migrate to India. And it obviously leaves out one prominent exception, which is Muslims. <coughs> um, India is the world's second largest Muslim country. It has 200 million Muslims. And there, Indians who voted with their feet during partition, they voted to stay in India. Uh, there's no Indian members of ISIS or Al-Qaeda. They, but the vast majority of them, are deeply grateful they're in India and not Pakistan or Bangladesh. But the government is systematically othering Indian Muslims. And it's doing the same thing at, um, to win votes. So it led me to think, you know, what is it that unites these people, these populists, um, whether it's Trump here or Modi there or Putin or Duterte or Bolsonaro in Brazil, how is it that they've come to power today? And it's about storytelling. A populist, as I said, is a gifted storyteller. He can tell a false story well. And the only way to fight him is by telling a true story better. This is why people like me, journalists, writers, other enemies, in country after country, they're going after the press like never before. Trump has declared journalists enemies of the people. The BJP in India uses the same language. Orban in Hungary uses the same language. There's a friend of mine, Atesh Tafir, who lives in New York, who uh, came to India when he was two. His mother's Hindu. His father, who he never really knew, was a Pakistani politician who was killed. Um, he's never lived in Pakistan. He you know, he was in India from two till his 30s, and then he moved here. So he and I have this thing called an OCI card, an Overseas Citizen of India card. He wrote an article on the cover of Time magazine that was critical of Modi during the last elections. And just recently, a couple of weeks ago, his overseas citizenship was stripped from him. And the ostensible reason given was that his father was Pakistani. They could do the same thing to me. Um, so they're doing this, they're going after journalists um, because they know that you know, we can fight their narrative. We're seeing this battle of narrative. We're seeing it now in the 2020 election where immigration is going to be the single biggest uh, domestic issue. So why are these people who are in these states, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, why would they fall for these? Because most of them, most of the people who vote for, who, who are afraid of immigrants, they generally don't meet immigrants in their day-to-day -day lives. The people who voted for Brexit were people in the rural areas of England who didn't have day-to-day -day experience of migrants. People in London voted overwhelmingly to stay in the EU because London is an incredibly multicultural international city. So people see people from all over the world and they know that they're not a threat. It's the same thing in New York. New York, you know, the cities of America um, are incredibly welcoming to migrants. 
So I took a drive out um, in the summer of 2016. I took a road trip from California to New York, and I set my Google Maps setting on avoid highways, <laughs> best way to see the country. And I remember just driving into this um, town in Pennsylvania, Warren, Pennsylvania, in the Alleghenies. And uh, it looked like a beautiful town, beautiful old factory buildings. And I stopped there, uh, and there was a, uh, a building which said Blair Company Museum. When I walked in, it turned out to be uh, a corporate museum. There was a company called the Blair Company, which during the Second World War started uh, manufacturing raincoats for American GIs and then prospered 40s, 50s, 60s. There's a little museum with um, pictures on the walls uh, and a statue of the founder in a hat and a trench coat standing next to his personal elevator which took him to his third floor office and all these pictures. And the pictures on the wall were, most of the town worked for the Blair Company in Warren, Pennsylvania. As long as the pictures were in black and white, 40s, 50s, early 60s, with each year there were more people in the pictures, they looked more prosperous. When the pictures started entering the color era and America stopped becoming a manufacturing nation, there were fewer people in the pictures and you could see their expressions were different in the pictures. Um, 70s, 80s, 90s, the company declined. By the early 2000s, things had gotten so bad that the Blair Company had to hire an Indian CEO um, and then was bankrupt. Now it's owned by a succession of hedge funds. No one knows who owns the Blair Company. They don't manufacture anything anymore. They're just a mail order house for garments. Then I walked around the town and it was like Harlem in the 80s. There were young white people just stumbling around <coughs> the streets of this empty town. They were like zombies. There was an antique store um, uh, uh, which had all these stalls. It was kind of empty, but where the people of the town were literally selling their family jewels. You could pick up stuff for nothing because these people had nothing left to sell. And the manager of the antique store was a very friendly veteran. Uh, he I, you know, wanted some place to get lunch and he personally walked me to uh, to a, uh, a bar which served food. And I said, well, it looks like a beautiful town. He said, it used to be, but the only industry left is the military or uh, the drug trade. The, the young people were hooked on opioids and all they could do was either sell drugs or become cannon fodder. So their future too, these working class whites, had been stolen. Who stole it? Steve Bannon once said, the origins of the current wave of populism around the world it's originated in the 2008 financial crisis. Now, Bannon and I don't agree on much. Uh, he also likes the Bhagavad Gita, but you know that's where it stops. But here, I, f I feel he's right. Um, in the crisis, you know, people got sold homes that they couldn't afford by the bankers. And at the end of it, the bankers were bailed out, and the people who had homes lost their homes and their futures. These people are angry. They're furious. In Germany, they're furious. In Hungary, they're furious. In England, they're furious. Their futures, too, were stolen. Who stole them? You know, if you follow the money, it's, it's the elites. Um, inequality has never been higher on the planet. Today, there are six men whose collective wealth amounts to more than half of the human population combined. So these people were going to come out from Warren to Wall Street with pitchforks. And the elites, being no fools, knew that this outrage had to be deflected away from themselves and onto someone else. And who better than the newest, the weakest, the immigrants? Hannah Arendt called it the alliance between the mob and capital. Um, so you could see that, you know, when Trump first started rising, I mean, the elites in the Republican Party, they held their noses. They didn't want anything of this vulgarian from Queens. Um, but once he got in power, they're, you know, solidly behind him because he delivered from, for them. Um, it gave them the biggest 
corporate tax cut in history. Um, so again, I'm sort of, you know, uh, I mean, following the money and I'm, and I'm trying to see how this kind of outrage is channeled, is first stoked, astroturfed, and then channeled, and who it's channeled onto. Um, so as I said, it's an angry book, but with a happy ending. And the happy ending is that in the end, migration is really, it's good for everyone. It's good for the people moving, particularly for refugees from wars, because it, for, in many cases, it's literally the difference between life and death. Um, I met, for example, this, um, this young Honduran mother in a women's shelter in Tijuana, and she had an 18-month-old boy in her lap. Uh, and this boy was just angelic. Was just, um, she'd come from San Pedro Sula in Honduras, just 23 years old. Her um, husband had witnessed a gang murder, so he had to flee. And then the next day, he wasn't part of the gangs, but he just seen the gang murder. The next day, the gangs came to her and said, yeah, husband's gone, that's fine. We'll take your boy instead when he grows up. So she got on a bus and left. And she, and this was the height of the family separation crisis when we were snatching children from their mother's arms and sending them to these jails across the country. It shamed us as a nation. She was going to apply for a political asylum. And she had a legitimate claim for asylum, a well-founded fear. And I told her, listen, you can do this, but they might take your baby away from you. And she had tears in her eyes and she said, you know, this is what a mother's love is. I know I might never see my son again. And, but I know at least he'll be alive somewhere. Someday I'll have a hope of seeing him. And if I stay where I am, I know I'll have to put him when he's a teenager in a box six feet below the ground. This is the choice I'm faced with. Um, so, it, you know, migration literally saved the lives of people like her. Uh, it's good for the countries that they're moving to because the rich countries aren't making enough babies. We need them. Um, half of Americans are over 40, and the U.S. is going to become a nation of geezers as the baby boomers retire. Um, from now to 2065, immigrants and our children will make up 88% of the country's population growth. And this most directly affects Social Security. In 1960, there were five workers paying Social Security taxes for every retiree or disabled person. By 2013, there were fewer than three. In 2018, the U.S. fertility rate fell for the fourth straight year to 1.7 babies per woman. And the replacement rate is 2.1 babies per woman. Starting next year, the Social Security Administration will spend more money than it collects. By 2035, its reserves will be completely gone if it continues at the current rate. And you'll only get 80% of the benefits you're entitled to if you're on Social Security then. Um, immigration is one thing that can save Social Security systems and the pension systems of the rich countries. So it directly benefits these countries are not just with social security, but you know, immigrants started a quarter of all new businesses. Uh, immigrants started 60% of all the companies in Silicon Valley. I mean, the economic numbers are pretty much indisputable. Um, and countries that um, increase migration are doing better than the ones that don't economically. Canada, for example, hired McKinsey to show them how to increase uh, their immigrant intake. They want to bring in um, they want to triple their uh, immigration intake. You need warm bodies for cold countries. Um, and immigration is a good news story for the countries that the migrants leave behind. Because if you truly want to make the world a better place, the best way to help the poorest people is through remittances. The money that people like that Mexican man send back every week in $5, $10 gyros. Remittances last year amounted to some $700 billion, which is four times more than all the foreign aid in the world and 100 times more than all the debt relief in the world. And when people send back remittances, they'll, they send it to the people who most need it, their families, and it goes to building a house, paying for a medical bill, sending a child to college. 
It doesn't go to the corrupt governments. Um, so my book ends with a story about, again about the 2016 election, uh, where uh, my brother-in-law, uh, who was born in Fayetteville, North Carolina, uh, and he's Indian American, he's uh, Bengali. Um, he's married to my sister, and they live in Raleigh, North Carolina. So he calls me up and he says, um, I think I'm going to run for state senate. And I said, in the south, in North Carolina. <laughs> and your name is Jay Chowdhury. And you're running in a district that's 90% white. Uh-huh. How are you going to support my sister? <laughs> he says, no, I think I've got a shot. He'd never run for political office. And so Jay goes out and, you know, he's campaigning against a man named Ellis Hankins, who's ch chair of the League of North Carolina Municipalities. And, you know, there's Jay Chaudhary, a short uh, Indian American man, who had to train his own campaign staff in how to pronounce his last name. <laughs> he starts knocking on doors. He knocked on 10,000 doors. I went down to knock on doors for him. My two sons went down to knock on doors for him. And, you know, most of the people were welcoming, but you know, my younger son had a gun drawn on him. Get out of my yard. Uh, I had a dog set on me, although it was a small dog, a, a, a poodle named Chewy. <laughs> Chewy, you get back here. They're vicious, those poodles. But, <coughs> but we, we knocked on doors, and Jay spoke to these people about what concerned them, which is Republican defunding of schools. And he went and took his message to the voters, and they'd see this brown man coming down the driveway, and he came during blizzards, he came uh, rainstorms. People were posting Instagram pictures of him walking over a snowbank to, to knock at the front door. And he won in a landslide. And he's now sitting in the North Carolina Senate, First Indian American, not just state senator, but Democratic whip in the state senate. And they're now sounding him out to run for U.S. Senate. So it taught me all politics is local, all politics is, in, is personal. And the great thing about this country, the American exceptionalism, is that it's a country made up of all the other countries. Uh, and it is possible to make change happen. So I'll stop there, and I'm happy t to take questions in whatever time we, we've got left. I have a whole chapter on this. Immigrants are not going to take your jobs. Um, uh, there was, so, you know, there are different opinions, but among economists, there's pretty much a unanimous, near unanimous consensus that, um, in fact, l last night I was had a long talk with these two economists at MIT, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, who just won the Nobel Prize for economics, and we <laughs> spoke about exactly this. They said, it's actually a measure that immigrants take low-skill jobs. Uh, they, there is some short-term effect on high-skilled immigrants. And the best refutation of this is there was a landmark National Academy of Sciences study a couple of years ago. Um, uh, it's really just like the definitive word on the subject. Um, and they've shown that... Um, so, for, you know, let's take the low-skilled example. Uh, it, most immigrants do the jobs that Americans don't want to do. Uh, they're you know, farm workers, they're nannies, etc. Um, there is some short-term effect uh, on communities that experience a large surge all at one time, right? And I have some solutions for this in my book. Like, I think it is true that, um, uh, that communities along the border, let's say in El Paso, or in some of the Long Island suburbs, which have a lot of... Um, Latinos coming in who need schooling and bilingual education, that they need resources. And one way to do this is to uh, impose a fee 
or tax on companies that benefit by immigration, like tech companies. Tech companies really need immigration. And um, there's certainly uh, a room for uh, saying for each uh, immigrant that you bring in on an H-1B visa, like Indians or Chinese or whatever, you know, you pay a small fee, which then goes to those communities which are most directly impacted by immigration. Um, so if you really want to know, I mean, I could you know, tell you the numbers, but in my book, um, there's uh, all this data about how immigrants are not going to take your jobs, actually commit crimes at a lower rate than the native born, and I've got 50 pages of footnotes. Uh, I hired a professional fact checker to irritate me, um, and this again is one way which I think you know you can fight these false narratives of migration by just having a fact check story. Yes, please. Oh, it's among the most heartbreaking aspects yeah. of the migrant experience. Yeah. Well, so that's... So my yeah. question mm -hmm. to you is all these factors that's increasing migration mm -hmm. is impacting these women who feel forced. That's why mm -hmm. some of the women go through enhanced mm -hmm. immigration and some of them feel forced to leave their children behind. But it causes lots of trauma mm -hmm. for the kids because even though they're getting money, we talked about the mission mm -hmm. work, the emotional support mm -hmm. that children Right. For the first time, more than half of migrants are women. For the, um, and particularly countries, yeah, particularly countries like the Philippines, Sri Lanka. You know, um, uh, we had a nanny who uh, couldn't go back to India. She didn't have a visa. She was very loving to our children. Uh, and one day, someone was showing her uh, uh, wedding pictures of a wedding in uh, her village in India. And she looks at, uh, this, uh, this was a few years ago before you know Skype really came into uh, general use. Um, and she was looking at some pictures and she was, oh, who's that girl? And the person who was showing the pictures looks at her oddly and says, that's your daughter. And she burst into tears because she hadn't seen her daughter for 10 years. So there are, all these stories all around us. I mean, you you know, you don't have to go far. Ask your cleaning lady, ask your nanny. Your, there are all these women taking care of other people's children. And yes, it's, it's, uh, it's awful just to see your mother for Christmas when she comes, you know, bearing all these gifts and then she has to go back a month later. It's even worse n never being able to see your mom. Um, somewhere on earth, there ought to be a sa sanctuary spot when mothers can see their children and give them a hug, you know, that, and where governments aren't allowed to ask them about their papers. There ought to be, there's 
I can't think of any law which could supersede this, the right of a mother to give her child a hug. But all over the world, you have these mothers who may never be able to give their children a hug. They're heroines because they, they're doing it, almost all of them, so that they can make a better life for their kids. Yeah, they get the Sundays off and that's what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I have a section in my book about Abu Dhabi. So um, I teach at NYU, which has now expanded all over the world. It's like Starbucks or the East India Company. It <laughs> there's an NYU in every country. Um, and I taught at NYU Abu Dhabi for a few months. And, you know, it's a spectacularly unjust place where your humanity is defined by your nationality, um, where if, uh, you know, the 90% of the population works for the other 10%. Um, and there's such a hierarchy. If you're, you know, on top are the Emiratis, then there are the white expats, then there are the brown expats, then there are the black expats, when one group of expats, so one year the Bangladeshis rioted, and so the next year there were no visas given to Bangladeshis, the, and they replaced the Bangladeshis with Ghanaians. So suddenly all the cabbies who used to be Bangladeshis were now Ghanaians. Um, and, you know, you're, you're defined by your citizenship. So the greatest inequality in the world today is the inequality of citizenship. It's like feudal class privilege. You're determined by what country you're born into. Your fate is determined by what country you're born into. You know, and, and this phenomenon of... So I, if you live in the Emirates, you will never have any political rights. It doesn't matter if you're born there. Even if you're born there, you don't have the right of residence there unless you are a student or you have a job. You can be kicked out of the country and it's up to you where you go next. Right? So this is this other model of citizenship uh, where it's citizenship only for... It's determined by ethnic origin, uh, uh, not place of birth. Yes. Thank you. Well, you write that, you know, there's always been this tension between America as a country of immigrants and, yeah, America country of the immigrants who've already immigrated, but no one else. Um, in the 1700s, Benjamin Franklin was railing against these aliens who were coming into the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. He says, ah, oh, these people, they don't speak our language, uh, they don't worship our gods, they will never assimilate these Palatine boars. He was speaking about the Germans, the ancestors of our current <laughs> president, right? And the know-nothings in the 19th century and the, uh, the various immigration bills which discriminated against this or that. So Northern Europeans over Southern Europeans, um, 
the Alien Exclusion Act, no the Chinese. There's always been these waves of resistance. Um, um, but this one is, I think it's new. It's, it's really shocking because it seems like, all right, we've elected Obama, son of an immigrant, everything's great, you know, history has ended. Uh, we've, we're, um, we can all live happily now. But there was, you know, a, a huge kind of resistance, and part of it was cultural. Part of it was the narrative, and it's very much alive. You know, don't be lulled into a, 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 a false sense of security. There's, um, there's a lot of resistance to, you know, I, I grew up in Jackson Heights, and Jackson Heights works. Uh, and it works because no one ethnicity predominates, right? I, um, it's it's the most, there are more languages spoken in the zip code that I grew up in than any other in the country. And I grew up in a, in a building full of Indians and Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, uh, uh, Haitians, Dominicans, Jews, Muslims. The building was owned by a Turkish man, but the super was Greek. These were all people who had been killing each other just before they got on the plane. <laughs> and here we were living next to each other and sharing our foods, and it's not that we stopped hating each other. We all said horribly racist things about everyone else. <laughs> but there was, you know, think of the last time there was any major ethnic conflict in New York City. It was in the 1990s. New York's never been richer or safer. It's also never been more unequal, but so far it hasn't manifested itself in, uh, uh, in scapegoating of immigrants. Quite the opposite. It's a sanctuary city. But not all of the U.S. is like that. And, you know, I, I've also spent three years in Iowa, and when I was in Iowa in the writer's workshop in the 1980s, it was a much more tolerant place than it is now. I recently took a drive through Iowa, and it was quite frightening. Because, again, it's about narrative. These people are suffering. There's no doubt that they're suffering. But they've been taught, they've been somehow, a lot of it is Fox News. 94% of Fox News watchers are white. And it spreads these lies about immigrants like night after night. Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram, you know, going on and on about uh, these hordes of people that they're, they're here to, you know, take from you. I really want to go on Tucker Carlson just so I can call him Taquito. Uh, uh, I don't know if they'll invite me, but, you know, Ann Coulter uh, wrote a column against me after my book came out, so, you know, I wear it as a badge of honor. Um, but this thing about, you know, not being at home in Pakistan, I understand that too. When I went back to India this time, I didn't feel at home. It had changed beyond comprehension. But this is, so I think there's a new pattern of migration worldwide. Let's think of migration not as an arrow, but as a circle. So there's communities of people like you and me, like many of the people in this room, who live not in a country, but in a locality. So I live in Greenwich Village, and uh, uh, some of the year in the Bandra district of Bombay. Sometimes I also go to Paris or London, where I have friends or family, so I have a room in these places. I mean, not literally, I'm not that rich, but um, I, I can go between these localities and have pretty much the same life. I could wake up, have Colombian coffee, have an uh, Indian vegetarian lunch and an Italian pasta meal for dinner, and uh, I might see f friends in that I met in Bombay last week that I will meet in New York this week, who I'll see um, in Paris next week. But this is not just for people who uh, you know, are rich or middle class or have papers. There's a community of Mexicans I know of in Sunset Park. They all come from one village in Puebla. And um, so they go between this village in Puebla and this, and the Sunset Park uh, district of Brooklyn. And these are the two localities that they travel between. Um, and so I call people like them, people like us, interlocals. We don't so much belong to a nation or a state or even necessarily a city, but to localities within these places. You know, we're wedded to two or more localities. And those who have papers, you know, this is how they move. It's a new mod model of migration. What is exile when a round trip home is 500 bucks? It's in the back. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I imagine it must have been really traumatic. And, you know, that most immigrants uh, have had experiences m maybe not as dramatic. I mean, I have a few of them in my book. When I first came to this country, uh, I was in this incredibly racist Catholic school, and I was regularly just bullied for being who I was. Um, so that's a, that's a very valid question. Like, why does he hate you so much? We've never met you. Why, why you? There's a James Baldwin quote. It says, I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hate so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. I think that just sums it up. Once the hate is gone, they'll be forced to deal with pain. It's it's a just it's an internal calculus, and it um, it's the same the world over. I mean, you know, uh, just as this man fears and hates the Roma, uh, these white racists in my school fear and hated brown people or black people. Uh, there are Indian Hindus who fear and hate Bangladeshis, there are South Africans who fear and hate Zimbabweans and Nigerians. But migration, you know, when we travel, we, we meet other migrants, we meet, I think this is one of the best ways to overcome that hate, uh, that everyday lived interaction. And this is borne out by the studies, uh, by voting patterns. People who meet migrants regularly in their everyday lives get to know them as, as individual human beings. And then there's some hope that they'll, that they'll hate them less. Yes. <laughs> You're totally right. Yeah, it is. Uh, so, maybe the answer isn't with economists, and the two economists I was speaking about were very open about. They feel that. Economists have no power. They're really, economists are less respected than weathermen. Um, so yeah, the 50 pages of footnotes are there as really as backup for the human stories. So I'm at heart a novelist. I went to the Iowa Writers Workshop. I'm a licensed fiction writer. Uh, the economics part of it came later to me because I felt the need to back up these stories so they don't remain mere anecdotes. But ultimately, it's going to be stories like the, you know, the pinky kisses, you know, anyone who sees this, who experiences this, sees the longing for these migrants to unite, they're going to be moved, some part of them. You get to them to the heart and then you might get them to the mind. And you're also right that the reason the Trumpian narrative works is that it, it is so simple to the point of being simplistic. It's also entertaining. He <laughs> yeah. And, you know, he speaks in terms of parables. It's really interesting. And I think we could learn from him, the, the left or the people who want to tell the true stories better. You know, or too often we rely on these numbers, right? The, all these think tanks, God bless them. They've got reams and reams of these academic studies. But you know what? 
um, Trump kind of speaks in parables. I met a fellow once, Jim, in Paris. He was my friend. He told me that there's no go zones. No, you know, and that Jim from Paris is never fact check. Most people aren't going to read the fact check on who Jim in Paris is, but he he communicates directly, and he tells he says what he says without equivocation, without on the other hand, um, and we're very conscious about nuance and subtlety as, as we should be, but there are some things, you know, like a mother's love for a child, which th- there is really isn't an other side, you know, there isn't an uh, other side to I don't know. Cannibalism. <laughs> on the one hand, uh, it, some people say it's wrong to eat your fellow man. On the other hand, people say it's a cheap and readily available source of protein. That you know, <laughs> there can't be any McNeil uh, debate on this. Um, so, so I think we've got to get better at that kind of storytelling. Um, and you know, you can only tell a false story so many times. I think. There will be. There already is a backlash to this kind of story. You can only fool um, all of the people some of the time, um, and even among his followers. I know it's a, it's an emotional issue, but it's partly our fault um, that we, first of all, haven't. Before you tell someone a story, you've got to listen to their story, and I don't think we've done a good enough job of listening to those people's stories. We listen to their stories, and then we find out why it is that they're so receptive to this bullshit, right? And then we counter it with a true story, a fact-check story, a footnoted story, but also entertainingly told. You know, this is what I try to teach my students at NYU Journalism, that the reader is entitled not just to information, but al- also to pleasure. I mean, and when you think of things that have really changed history, it's been novels, films, uh, uh, First the heart, then the mind. Uh, yes, please. Number. Um, so, all right. So people often ask me, like, you've written this book. You're preaching to the choir. Sometimes the choir needs a bit of preaching, too. That's why they're in church. Um, <laughs> I think of my book as ammunition, all right? It's, not, I, that it, it's a book that gets people riled up. Um, and um, it's... It, and something that you know you can take to your Thanksgiving dinner, and when your racist uncle starts going on about uh, immigrants and whatever, <laughs> because I have one too, <laughs> you, know, you can refer to to these stories and to these numbers, which back up your arguments. Uh, and in the end, it's really important, you know, to get our people out. There's m- more of us than there are of them. Politically, we have the power, as my brother-in-law demonstrated. Uh, and you know what? I'd like to. I know we have been running short of time, but I'd just like to read out one letter which illustrates the power of storytelling, if I may. It's, it's a short email that I just got last week from a woman in New Zealand who'd read uh, my book. Um, and, you know, I I've often wonder, you know, why am I writing? Um, why am I writing at all? And why am I writing this book? Or who is it for? Who's going to read it? Who's going to be convinced? So I get this email. Dear Mr. Mehta, my name is Nisha Nair. I'm 40 years old, and I work as a public health doctor in Wellington, New Zealand. I migrated here as a 16-year-old from Malaysia slash Brunei without my parents. I've been here ever since. I love it, and I hate it. I read your book, The Immigrant's Manifesto, a week ago. I gulped it down in about 12 hours straight. I had no idea how hungry I was for the things you said in it until I read it. Moving here has been the most defining experience of my life, but I've never examined it too closely. I'm not sure why not. For 24 years, I think I swallowed the immigration rhetoric that floats around here. I bought it hook, line, and sinker. Until the day before your book, I honestly believed that I was what they said, an opportunist who, an opportunist who snuck into the country when the immigration laws were less rigid that no amount of tax or contribution would ever equal the privilege of being allowed to stay here, that I was not entitled to bring over my aging parents whom I miss and worry about in a way that words can't hold because they had never, quote, contributed to the country, that I was to be congratulated for being the right kind of migrant because of my profession, my good English, my adaptability, my interest in rugby, my ability to read a room, and adjust my behavior accordingly to be just the right small amount of exotic and the right large amount of kiwi. Uh, 
I really needed your book. I have it on my phone, highlighted and annotated. I read it on the way to work and between meetings and on the weekends. It seems a little over the top. But then again, I have never encountered anything like your book before. I feel as if someone has stood up for me after many years. My shoulders are a little straighter these days. After years of not belonging anywhere, I'm really proud to claim membership of this scrappy, tenacious, optimistic little community of global border crossers. I'll never look at my brown face the same way again. Thank you. Right, I, so this is why I write the distant echo in the kindred heart. Um, and, um, uh, you know, this is my story, and it's, I think it's all our story. It's a universal story of migration. So thank you. Thank you.